Hello everyone! Welcome to the newest video where I will talk about XLSTM and music. And this will be the first video where I will introduce Heli Brunner, my Hugging Face Compatible XLSTM Trainer. As always, please be so kind, like this video, subscribe to my channel and if you have any questions let me know in the comments. Until then, now XLSTM for music. Let's talk about XLSTM. Quite some time ago, I think it was around the end of last year, people got really, really excited because Sepp Hochreiter announced that XLSTM will come. And XLSTM was sold as a kind of GPT killer, which means that it's going, or people believed, or people promised that XLSTM is going to clean up a couple of problems that we have with the language models that we are now using on an everyday basis. XLSTM is Extended Long Short Term Memory. It is an extension of a long short term memory architecture, the LSTM, which was developed in the 1990s. And it turned out that it was a very, very cool neural network architecture for processing sequences while also while processing the sequences, maintaining some sort of state, some sort of memory. It increased performances in sequence processing and it also eased the pain with the vanishing gradient problem, which means that the neural network is not going to learn anymore. We realized when we used LSTM, the original LSTM, that um, it does not parallelize properly in training, which means training takes quite a lot of time. It also um, we felt this when we did these experiments in the community that the longer the sequences, the higher would be the probability that the memory would not work properly. properly. Which means the longer the sequences, the higher the chance that the new network, the LSTM, would forget anything that was at the beginning of a sequence. And we keep in mind, well, now we're always talking about sequence length, context size, it's like how much data, how much text we can feed into a neural network in order to solve some problem. And the more the better, because we would like to include everything that we got from vector databases and a long system prompt and so on and so forth. In 2017, things changed significantly with the release of Attention is All You Need, which spawned the entire family of transformers, self-attention-based transformers. Self-attention-based transformers like BERT and GPT overcame a couple of problems that we had with LSTM. For example, that now it can work like a charm with long sequences and also the training is highly parallelizable. But this, well, these contributions came at a price and the price was both processing time and memory footprint where a square function of the sequence length which means if you have too long a sequence, inference time will be too long and maybe you run out of memory. And well, we are talking about always, we're always talking about the sequence length. Um, every time you take a look at one of the new transformers, you always care about like, what is the sequence length? How much text can I put into and how, will, how well will it scale with the sequence length? XLSTM promises to be linear with sequence length when it comes to processing time and it has a constant memory footprint. So this will allow us to do quite a lot of nice use cases, including even running it on the edge if you have a small LSTM. Also XLSTM is to a certain degree parallelizable and according to the paper, at least for small data sets, it shows performance that is on a similar level as the established GPT architectures that we know. Still, a few experiments are missing, which means that we, well, we have to scale it. Bigger X LSTM architectures and also bigger data sets to see, well, how well they actually perform. And this is one um, reason why I'm making this video. If you'd like to take a look around, there is an XLSTM repository that you can have a look at, which made me very, very happy a few months ago when it was actually released. So now everyone can train their own XLSTMs on their own data sets, which means, well, everything that you like, everything that comes as a sequence from multivariate time series and also to sequences of tokens in natural language processing. So here, invitation, have a look around. 
And also another invitation, there is another repository by yours truly, the XLSTM resources, where you will find, well, the paper and a couple of other papers from other persons, where, for example, here it's for time series, also for vision and um, more time series here. So tells us that everything that can be done with a transformer encoder and or decoder can also be done with XLSTM blocks. There are a few implementations out there where currently the original XLSTM implementation has the highest number of stars. There are also a couple of others where, well, I don't think that any one of those is going to come out on top. And also here at 39 stars is Helibrunum, which is the main contribution of this video. Coming back to the XLSTM implementation, I, I find it quite fascinating and, well, easy to install, easy to use, but I felt that something was missing for me. And the something that was missing for me is that I would love to train large language models on data sets that I host on Hugging Face. So Hugging Face today is something like the de facto standard when it comes to well, storing data sets. And I would like to work in a sense that I can just plug in any XLSDM architecture and also can plug in any data set or multiple data sets from Hugging Face and then just press play on tape and uh, train an XLSTM on the data set. Here, well, not possible right out of the box. That's why I implemented Haley Brunner, which allows you to do exactly that. Train XLSTM using the original implementation of a new network on any text data set that you like. Well, let's have a look at a GitHub repository. AI-Guru Heli Brunner, my Hugging Face Commodore X LSTM trainer with this very, very nice logo that I also have on a t-shirt. So I really, really like that. Well, coming back again, the main contribution of this repository is it takes the original X LSTM implementation that you would install following the manual of the X LSTM um, GitHub repository, and it will allow you to train the XLSTM on text datasets that live on Hugging Face, which, well, required some effort. And I also, well, as a second um, contribution, I also wanted to parallelize training in a sense that if you have multiple GPUs, that it works like a charm on, on multiple GPUs. First, before I dig deeper, Heli Brunner, Heli Brunner, why is it called like that? It's an old name for the city of Heilbronn. Heilbronn? Um, I'm, I'm, how can I say, very in love with the city. I work there. Um, most of the time I work from Würzburg, but traveling is, is no problem. I have been AI artist in residence at Kaisalong in Heilbronn, which is connected to 42 Coding School. I'm now working with a lot of people in Heilbronn, including Schwarz IT, which are the people who do lots of cloud computing, and also Bildungscampus, where, well, we and other people, um, like, contribute to more people learning and applying artificial intelligence. I started just, I think, one and a half weeks ago with this implementation, again, having in mind, let's use Hugging Face, but also accelerated training if you have multiple GPUs. I kindly invite you to have a look at the repository yourself. I will include the link in the description. And in the next step, I will show you, well, um, how you can use it on your own data set. But first, if you like, well, the star history is here. There is a star button. If you like the repository, please uh, click on the star button, which will boost visibility a little. We are very close to actually training XLSTM on a text data set. Speaking of which, here is a text data set, which looks a little queer if you look at it for the first time, because it has strange little things in it. Um, well, if you lean back, you see, well, this is actually text. This is something that maybe would be human readable if you practice a little. Uh, long story short, well, this is a music representation that is compatible with large language models. So it has lots and lots of tokens, and each token is like a control token for something that would happen um, when playing the music, like note starting, time elapsing, note stopping, and so on and so forth. So it's very close to the general MIDI standard. 
JS Fakes Garland 100K. Well, it's based on the JS Fakes dataset by Omar Peracha. That's the Hello World dataset that I always go to when I do something new with deep neural networks for music. Um, it includes, I think, 1000 chorales that sound like the chorales composed by Johann Sebastian Bach. I used them and I sampled them. So I did some data augmentation on the original samples and I generated 100,000 samples for training from that by changing tiny little things like, for example, pitch shifting. So this data set has 100,000 samples, which is not that much when you want to train a deep neural network on text. It also has a total token count of 80 million. 80 million is nothing, but this would mean that I can actually check my implementation. I can check it in no time. So training will not take weeks. It maybe just take a couple of minutes. And also I can do quick iterations. Um, if this works, which, well, <laughs> spoiler alert, it does, I would then later increase the number of samples and also the neural network architecture. So, well, here's a data set on music, just 113 megabytes, very easy to use, very easy to experiment with. And, well, this is what we, I will do next. Next, training a music data set with Halle Brunner. Um, your invitation stands. If you'd like to do your own experiments, you can git clone Halle Brunner, follow the installation instructions, and then come up with your own data set and just put it in. I'll show you in a moment how you can put in your own data set. And then you train neural network, and then hopefully you get a very nice language generator. In this case, I'll show you how to do a music neural network. So here, read me again There's nothing nothing to be afraid of here's a critical plot point so how the thing works is first you have to provide a config file a config file for configuring the entire training it involves a few things first and foremost here at the bottom you have a data set and this is where you can actually squeeze in your own data set so you provide a hugging face id it also works if you have um, a data set on your hard drive, but usually if you put it to Hugging Face, everything will be fine. Here is the data set that I just showed you, JS Fakes Garland um, 2024 100K. Garland means that the music representation looks like a garland, so it's bar by bar by bar by bar in the representation. So here you squeeze in your data set, which is like already most of the work, because we remember when you do anything that has to do with deep neural networks, you spend a lot of time on the data and not so much time on the actual training, except for, well, you have to wait for the loss to converge, but there you're usually very, very unbusy. You're just monitoring the whole thing, how it runs online. Around about 99% of the time you spend data preprocessing and then one of the of 1% of the time that you actually invest, except for waiting as well, new network architecture. In order to translate any data set into something that is understandable by a deep neural network, which means you have to translate it to numbers, in NLP you will use a tokenizer. When you do time series, you would standardize or normalize the data. For texts, you have to tokenize them, which means the text is split into tokens and each token is represented as, as an index to a vocabulary. Here I will well instruct the trainer to come up with an own, own white space tokenizer, which is creates a tokenizer from scratch. What you can also do is you plug in any tokenizer that you like. You can use, for example, an upcycle GPT-2 tokenizer. Um, as seen in the XLSTM paper, or use a Llama, Llama 2, Llama 3 tokenizer, Mistral tokenizer, all the tokenizers that also live on Hugging Face can be used here. Now we have a dataset and we have a tokenizer. Getting closer to the neural network itself, here is the model, number of blocks, embedding them, and so on and so forth, parameters for the model architecture. The XLSTM consists of a sequence of blocks. Each block can be either an MLSTM block or an SLSTM block. Each block can have a number of heads, which means parallel processing in a block. 
The model itself has an embedding dimension, which means like how many numbers to use in order to represent the tokens or the token embeddings. And you also specify which of the positions, which blocks are S LSTM blocks. Usually you have way more M LSTM blocks than S LSTM blocks. There's a ratio of seven to one mentioned in the paper. And of course, sequence length, which means like how long a sequence the architecture is going to, to process. I can already hint at, after training, you can increase the context length and go wild. It says in the paper that when it comes to long sequences, XLSTM has a very, very low per perplexity, which means it scales with longer sequences, especially with sequences that it has not been trained on. Training itself, here you go. Nothing to be afraid of. It's the usual things that you would need. You have to specify a model name, uh, batch size for parallelizing the training. You would like to max out your memory. You would like to have as many samples as possible. There's a start, a learning rate. Usually you start with a bigger learning rate and somehow decay to a small learning rate. So learning rate scheduling comes to mind. We'll use, as suggested in the paper, the first 10% of all the steps for warming up. So it's a linear warm up from a small learning rate to the learning rate itself. It also has a decay in a cosine fashion. So which means that until the end of a training, which in our case is one epoch, the learning rate is going to decay to a minimum. There's also some weights decay happening inside um, the neural network itself. We will train for one epoch. We will put everything to the output directory as specified here. We will save the neural network every 500 steps, which for a small neural network is fine. When you train a neural network for a couple of days or even weeks, you might get this number higher or else you will just clutter your hard drive with uh, lots and lots of checkpoints, which will also mean that you might run out of memory. And well, if you have a big neural network, saving the neural network will take some time. So you speed up the training by that. Also logging every step, which is like how often it's going to log uh, any statistics somewhere else. 1B project, weights and biases. We also specify a name for weights and biases. Torch compile. If you would like um, to speed up the training by compiling the model, it's a new feature introduced um, a while ago in, in PyTorch. This is well, how you would start. So if you would like to do some training, you have to come up with a data set the tokenizer and the, train, the training itself, and the model architecture, and usually you spend way more time on the data set. What you would do, and this is just a preview, I will show you in a moment an actual training run. You would then call the training script, um, which will do everything, including data set pre-processing um, when necessary. Well, chunking and batching is something that comes to mind. It will make sure that those training parameters in a config file are properly set up. It will create an accelerator, which means it allows for distributed training um, and well, doing quite quite a lot of things. A little math here, setting up um, the, 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 the optimizer, um, enabling weights and biases if necessary. And then here is the main part. It goes for all the epochs, for all the batches and does well, the stochastic gradient descent. Um, similar to the original um, implementation with this tiny little difference that now it uses Accelerate and has a little bit more sophisticated logging that is weights and biases compatible. Well, let's train the beast. Now, let's train it. Coming back to the configuration where we have a data set and a new network architecture, now comes the critical plot point. Well, how to actually train it. Let me show you. Create a new terminal. Um, I would believe that if you are here that you have already set up XLSTM following the instructions, which means that I can now conda activate XLSTM. So it's a dedicated environment for everything that I do with XLSTM. I've already mentioned that the um, training is facilitated by Accelerate. Accelerate is um, a library by Hugging Face that allows you to distribute your training on multiple GPUs and also on a cluster of GPU nodes well, in order to get maximum speed out of it. So every GPU will do something for each GPU will have one process um, doing some deep learning and results get um, aggregated, which means that 
the more GPUs you have, the faster will the training be. And if you remember uh, back in the old days when people trained GPT-3, which is really, really vintage flavor, you would need like 400 um, GPUs in order to train that here. Well, I don't have 400. Let me show you. So according to NVIDIA SMI, NVIDIA SME, I have two graphics cards, which are next door. So 390 um, GeForce RTX in um, like a little bit more sophisticated AI game place. Yeah, it's, an, it's more like a gaming computer, which I use for my first experiments. Okay, let's get those beasts busy. How can I do it? First and foremost, we need Accelerate. It has to be installed. And then there's Accelerate Launch, which is the thing that we actually want to do. We call the training script and we have to provide it with a config file. And the config here lives in convicts and is called JSFX Garlands. JSFX Garland 2024. Press play on tape. So comes the initialization. Look at this nice little logo. It does some dataset pre-processing, which includes tokenization. Obviously, now the new network was generated. We see the architecture here, and it creates a run on weights and biases. Let's see. Ignore index. So slowly progressing. 3,125 steps. We are now at step 40. So it's slowly crawling forward like the Terminator at the end of a Terminator movie. Estimated time of arrival is in 13 minutes, which, well, when it comes to large language models, it's nothing. We're very patient. It's no problem if you work on a real data set, the training will last for weeks, if not even months. Let's have a look at weights and biases. There you go. Something should have happened here. And we see that, oh, look at this, the loss is already going down. If the learning rate is, is doing a linear warm-up, and the loss of a neural network is going down slowly. Yes, around about 15 minutes later, we have a lovely loss that seems to converge properly. So rather high value at the beginning goes down, converges to a rather small value. I did some experiments with training this data set longer, didn't make a big difference at all. So maybe I need a bigger data set, but this is something for the future. Let's see how well this neural network performs. We remember that my goal was to have a neural network that actually composes music. Here's a tiny little notebook where I can load a language model, which means I can point it at any checkpoint that I have. Here I have JSFX Garland's XLSTM one to three different checkpoints. This is something from this morning where well, after some feature implementation and bug fixing, this was the first checkpoint that worked. And here 1220 from a few minutes ago, that's the one we've just trained. The language model itself is a wrapper around the checkpoint, which allows you to do the random inference with sampling, the, the temperature sampling. So let's load the model. No problem whatsoever. That's the model we have just, we've just trained. Um, just a little auxiliary code for mapping the generated tokens to something that resembles music. And here, well, we start with Garland start. This is actually in the music notation how a whole Garland starts, and then it will be followed by lots and lots and lots of nodes. 
Here is the model generate the temperature sampling, which takes a prompt as an input. Um, a temperature for like bigger temperature means higher um, randomness. End tokens went to stop generation. Every time we hit next, which is like a couple of bars, next, a couple of bars, next, and so on and so forth. It does some plotting on the way. Let's just quickly run this. So here we get elapsed time and tokens per second. It's rather fast. So 100 tokens per second running on the computer next door. There you go, 20 iterations, we're done. Next would be, well, taking those tokens and mapping it to something that we would hope, fingers crossed, look like music. Let's play that one. Amazing, they grow up so quickly. So now I'm very motivated to um, take more data sets, maybe again heavy metal and train XLSTM on that. And I'm most curious about how well it performs when I make the sequences longer and longer and longer, especially longer than the sequences I've trained on. Like how consistent will the music build? Will it repeat motives? Um, will it be, how can I say, surprising while also repeating a couple of things? I don't know, I would love to find out. But well, this was just one example how to train XLSTM on some text. Coincidentally, the text was representing some music. I have to ask you if you're curious about this, if you're curious about just using natural language to train XLSTM, you're invited. Go to Helibrunner, plug in your own dataset, configure your own XLSTM architecture of how many blocks you would like to use and then go wild. If you need anything, well, you'll find me here on, on YouTube. You'll all find me on X and you'll all fi also find me on LinkedIn. Happy to help. Until then, have a great day and, well, I hope you liked that. If you liked it, hit like. And please, if you didn't do so yet, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.